If you have your Bible open uh, and you'd like to reopen it to Galatians, that would be wonderful um, as we come to look at Galatians. Um, sorry, as I sort everything out in my pockets here a wee second. Um, and just as, as we come before God's word, uh, will we just take a moment and pray briefly? Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, as we open your word and we look at it together and we want to figure out what you're saying to us, would you open our hearts? Would you make our eyes see and would you make our ears hear that we would hear your voice? Father, this is your holy and perfect word, so would we listen to it with that expectancy? For it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Um, the title for, for this sermon is uh, One Message for All. The idea that there is one message and one gospel that no matter where you go, it, it doesn't change. And that might seem like quite a strange thing in our culture. We, we're quite used to the idea that, you know, you will have some beliefs that will be culturally ingrained or you'll have some things that you hold to. And if you were to meet somebody from the other side of the planet, um, that they would maybe disagree with you on that. How can the gospel, how, how can what we believe about Jesus and sin be something that no matter where you go, and no matter what country you're in, and no matter what culture you're from, it is still true and is still the same. And it, what's interesting is whenever you begin to look at what sort of ideas are able to transcend countries and transcend cultures, you begin to see that a lot of them are very culturally and nationally ingrained. So if you take the biggest religions after Christianity are, for example, Islam. And Islam, if you were to, to, in a sense, like highlight all of the places where Islam is, is the dominant religion or highlight where the population density of, of people who practice the Islamic faith live, you would see it's almost like a big belt that goes across the middle of the world. Um, one third of, popula of the population of the earth who identify as Muslim live in South, uh, Southern Asia. Uh, then most of the rest of the other two thirds live in either uh, North Africa or in the Middle East. Um, now the, there is more outside of that, but that's where the densest population is. And it's funny because it can't seem to get beyond that. It's very culturally ingrained within this one band across all of the world. If you go into Northern Europe, it's not the dominant religion. If you go into um, Southern Africa or into South America, it's not the dominant religion. And then if you take another religion, like Hinduism, um, Hinduism, which is the third largest religion in the world, 95% of its population are, in, are people who identify as Hindu live in India. It is almost nationalistically bound to being Indian, is to be Hindu. But it can't, it's, as a religion, it can't seem to get beyond those national borders. And even we might say, well, what about secularism? What about atheism? Surely that's an idea. Surely that's a belief about God that no matter where you go, it transcends culture and it transcends time. But then if you begin to look at actually where are the majority, the majority of countries that would ex be expressly atheist or expressly secular, they tend to be countries that have went through a similar process of experiencing Christianity and then experiencing something we call um, the Enlightenment. And it all generally is centered around Europe and America. But there's only one faith that seems to break and, and to get rid of all these trends. And that's Christianity. Christianity is not a religion where when you look at it, it's dominant in one area and one area alone. It's almost as if it's been split up throughout the whole world. So if you look at the demographics of where Christians live, about 25% of all Christians live in Europe, about another 25% live in Africa, about another 36% live in the Americas, so that's North or South America, and another 14% live in Asia. And one of the fastest growing churches in the world is actually the church in Asia at the minute, to the point where they reckon within the next 10 years, China will have the largest number of Christians, larger than any other country in the rest of the world. What is it that enables Christianity to transcend cultural and national boundaries in this way? What is it that allows it to transcend that and not to be bound by them? Well, I think quite simply it's this. We have one gospel and we have one God and that is true and relatable to every aspect of human experience no matter where you go. The gospel that we believe 
and the gospel that we talk about Sunday by Sunday is something that transcends nearly every other idea that exists in the world around us. Because the gospel we believe in is true and the gospel we believe in is worth holding to and worth preserving because it is the one thing that is true no matter where you are, no matter what you believe, no matter what culture you're from, and no matter what country you grew up in. And that is what Paul is most concerned about whenever he writes this letter. Whenever he writes this letter, he, he, he starts off in this section that we read with a bit of a confrontation. We read about Paul going down to Jerusalem, and as he's going down to Jerusalem, he's got a few things that he wants to clear up. Let, let, let's read it. I don't know if that's is that clear on the screen at all? Yep, great. Um, so let's hear God speak this. He says, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. And pay attention to this bit. It says, I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. So, so what does this mean? What does this mean? Well, Paul's going down to Jerusalem. And as he's going to Jerusalem, he wants to get the gospel straight. He wants to clarify and make sure that, it, that both he and the apostles to the Gentiles and the apostles that are in Jerusalem that are spreading the gospel amongst the Jews are both sharing the one gospel. that They're both singing from the same hymn sheet. Because as we kind of touched on maybe the first week that we looked at this book, there's a group who's arisen in Galatia um, called the Judaizers, and the Judaizers are trying to undermine Paul, and they're trying to undermine him two ways. They're trying to say that he doesn't have the authority of apostle, and therefore what he's saying is wrong, and they're also trying to undermine the gospel that he talks about and trying to say that it's wrong. And so whenever Paul says, I went down to Jerusalem, the Galatians probably knew that Paul had been down in Jerusalem. And the Judaizers was, would be, as my grandmother would have described them, good paddles and slurry tankers because they've been doing a bit of stirring. And what they've been doing is that they've been saying, oh, well, you know Paul had to go down to Jerusalem. Oh, well, you know why that was, don't you? Oh, he went down because he got in trouble and he had to get smacked on the wrist by the apostles. He said to you something that wasn't true and now we're going to correct it. And they've tried to spin Paul's journey to Jerusalem as if he's been pulled into the headmaster's office and told off. And Paul's wanting to say, no, 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 no. That is not what happened. That... And he's trying to get across his side of the story. And what he says that, yes, I went to Jerusalem, but I went, and if you look, it says, he didn't go because he was summoned. He wasn't subpoenaed. But rather he went because he was given a revelation. And we read through the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 11, verse 27, and there's a prophet, Agabus. And Agabus gives a prophecy to the church, and he says that there's going to be a famine in Judea. And it is in response to that, uh, that prophecy that there would be famine that Paul then departs to go to Jerusalem to aid the, the famine relief that was taking place there. And that's why if you look down at verse 10, at the end of the section, it says that all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I'd been eager to do all along. Paul's going down to help with famine relief. He's going on, on, on a relief mission, on an aid mission. But while he's there, he's got something else that he has to do. And that's what we see in the second half of that verse, where he says that I went in response to the revelation, but he wanted to meet privately with those who were esteemed leaders, so the key apostles, James, John, Peter, to make sure that I, had been, that I presented to them the gospel I'd been preaching among the Gentiles, to make sure I had not been running the race in vain. He wants to talk privately with these disciples. He wants to have a bit of a confrontation with them. Now, travel in the ancient world was no easy feat. It was something that you, would have, you could have been mugged by bandits on the way. You had to go through a lot of expenses to try and get anywhere. It took a long period of time to travel anywhere. Like, we think if you travel somewhere at the minute and you have to be quarantined for two weeks at the end of it, that that's a great inconvenience. Well, if you imagine, it would probably take him two weeks to travel maybe the length of your country and around this time. This is a big effort that he's doing. But it's worth doing. It's worth going down to Jerusalem and it's worth taking this effort because it's worth having this awkward conversation with 
the apostles in Jerusalem to make sure that everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet and make sure that everybody has the same gospel. Because there is only one God and there is only one gospel. And whatever we believe about the gospel is going to change what we think about God. There was a writer, A.W. Tozer, who said that the most important thing about you is what you believe about God. And so it flows from that that one of the most important things about you is also what you believe about the gospel. And if you have a poor view of the gospel or a view of the gospel that is lacking in some way, you're going to end up with a view of God that is lacking in some way. So maybe sometimes we think of the gospel as this. We maybe think of the gospel as God being angry at us for having sinned, but Jesus dies on the cross, and because Jesus died on the cross for us, God begrudgingly forgives us. And that's a poor view of the gospel, that's a wrong view of the gospel, but that twists our view of God. It means that we no longer have a loving Heavenly Father, but we've got a judicial court of a God who holds us accountable for everything and bangs his gavel at us. When really the gospel is something so rich and beautiful because it reveals the passion and the love of our, of our God in heaven. Because the gospel is that we have a God who from all of eternity, God the Father, who planned out of love, for he so loved the world, that he would send his one and only son, Jesus, the son, the son who would give his life for you and would ultimately save us from our sins by, take, by paying for them on the cross. And that God the Spirit, his entire work would be to apply that truth to our hearts and make us know it more and more each day. And that true view of the gospel means we have a rich view of God. And the issue with the Judaizers as in Galatia was that their gospel diminished God in some way. Because what it said was, yes, Jesus died for your sins, but he didn't observe the law for you. Jesus took away the sin, but he didn't do everything right on your behalf. So what this would mean is that for the Christians in Galatia, these Judaizers are trying to say, because Jesus didn't get circumcised for you, he didn't observe the law for you, he didn't do all the cleansing stuff, he doesn't avoid pork for you, you still have to do that. If you want to be a real Christian, you still have to do that. Yes, have faith in Jesus, but also observe all the religious laws of the Old Testament. And the issue with that is that that diminishes our view of Jesus. Because that says that Jesus came to do something less than what he actually came to do. Because what Jesus came to do was to die for our sins on the cross, but also to fulfill the law for us perfectly in a way that we could never fulfill it. Because the point of the law was that it would show us the holiness of God. And that's why if you ever come to a church breakfast, there'll be bacon. Because Jesus has fulfilled that law for us and we don't need to observe it anymore. That's why we don't sacrifice goats and we don't sacrifice pigeons and we don't, well, I was about to say we don't cleanse ourselves before coming to worship, but that started again for a whole different reason. But that's why we've gotten rid of all that because Jesus has fulfilled that law for us perfectly. And that's his whole work. It's a dying, but it's also a living for us. It's not just that he died for our sins, but he lived living the perfect life we couldn't live on our behalf. And the Judaizers have diminished Jesus because they're saying that the only thing that mattered was the death. And so it's a lesser view of God, and it's worth having the confrontation with these apostles over the nature of the gospel about that because that is a view of God that is wrong and one that is distorted and twisted and changes the way we relate to him. And so Paul goes and has this confrontation and he texts with him, he texts with him Titus as a test case. If you look down, we see that he took Titus also in verse one and he gives us, he fills it out a wee bit more for us as well in verse three. He says, you know, yet not even Titus who was with me was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false, some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy out the freedom we had in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. 
So in order to make his point that you don't need to follow the law and that it is enough that if you have faith in Jesus, your sins are forgiven, he brings along Titus. Titus, who is an ideal example of it. Titus, who would be a Greek Christian, a Gentile Christian, a Christian like you and me who doesn't follow the laws, who's able to eat all the bacon buddies he wants and have all the sausage rolls he wants, who's able to not observe the religious laws, who isn't circumcised, he's a normal Gentile Christian like you or me. And Paul wants to show us that he is as much a Christian as anybody in Jerusalem. And these false brothers, these Judaizers, have tried to rise up and say that he should get circumcised, he should get circumcised, that he's not a full Christian, he's not a proper Christian because he's not following these religious laws. And the issue with that is that that's created a two-tier Christianity. Because Paul wants to show that it's perfectly sufficient and it's perfectly good enough for, for Titus to be just a normal Christian who has faith in Jesus. He doesn't need to observe all these laws and he doesn't need to jump through all these hoops. He's just as much a Christian as everybody else. Because these Judaizers have created this two levels. Yeah, you know, you probably can be a Christian if you're a Gentile. But if you really want to be a Christian, if you really want to follow Jesus, you've got to follow all the religious laws as well. And so they've created this two-tier system as if to say, well, yeah, well, maybe he is a Christian, but really what you want to do is this. And they're looking down on him and they're frowning upon him. And this is why Paul resists against it because if, if there is a two-tier system in Christianity, we no longer have a gospel. We've got a lot of people who are trying to earn brownie points, brownie points with God. And I think we probably have functionally have a two-tier system in Christianity a lot at the minute. We probably are quite happy to think about God forgiving the sins that we are quite comfortable talking about. Say the lower tier sins. You know the sort of sins I'm talking about. Whenever you tell a wee white lie, whenever you go a few miles an hour over the speed limit, whenever you take all the pencils out of Ikea and you don't give them back, you know, all of those things that are a wee bit cheeky, you know, or whenever we're not quite as perfect as we wish we would be, we can imagine God forgiving those sins easy enough. Those are easy to forgive. And we maybe think that there's then another tier of sins. Sins like being unfaithful in our marriage. Sins like struggling with, with alcohol or drug addiction. Sins like struggling with our sexuality. We might think those are bigger sins and that they need something different to deal with them. And I think the reason we have adopted that view of sometimes having a poor view is if you almost need something more to forgive those big sins is because we've got a We've got a wrong understanding about grace for the most part. And I want you to listen really carefully to what I'm going to say because this sentence could go wrong quite quickly. But one of the ways we've went wrong about grace is this. There is no such thing as grace. There is no such thing as grace. What I mean by that is that grace is not a thing. It is, it, it is not a substance. If grace is a thing or a substance, it's almost like you need to store some more of it up. You know, we need to call around, carry around a bucket of grace, and whenever we sin, we need to rub some grace out of the bucket onto ourselves to cover it up. And that's not what grace is. Grace is not a thing. There's no currency of grace. There's no amount of grace. There's no, there's no thing. Grace. But that doesn't mean grace isn't real. Because grace is a person. Grace is the way God looks at you. Grace is God's disposition towards you. Grace is what God gives us in Jesus. We don't receive grace when we come to church on Sunday. As Christians, we do not receive grace. What we receive is Jesus. And Jesus is God's way of showing his grace and love towards us, showing that disposition that he has towards us. So if we have Jesus, we have grace, but it's not a thing that you need to store up more of. It's not as if whenever you sin, you need to go to church more and read your Bible more and pray more so you can store up more grace to have your sins forgiven. 
There's only one grace and it's Jesus. And, and you don't need to do anything more than have faith and trust in him to have even the biggest, darkest sins that lurk in your closet forgiven. Jesus is enough. Jesus is sufficient. He's all you need to be forgiven. You don't need more grace. You just need to have Jesus. And any amount of him will do. And that's why we have one gospel. We have one grace. We have one gospel because we have one God. And that's why Paul finishes up showing that there is one gospel for the one church that existed at this time. It would have been a huge problem if there, a rupture had occurred between the Gentile church and the Jewish church, because then it would have said that there was another way to God other than Jesus. And that's a massive problem because that's not the true gospel. And that's why what Paul says in this paragraph is so important. Where he says that those who were held in high esteem, whether whatever they were makes no difference to me, God shows no favoritism, they added nothing to Paul's gospel or to his message. On the contrary, they received that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. When they recognized the grace given to me, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and that they should go to the circumcised. Just as there is one message that Paul, and, that Paul goes with to the Gentiles, there is one message that John, Peter, and James go with to the Jews. Because there is one gospel, and there is one church, and there is one Jesus we trust in. And wherever we are, whatever we do, whatever we have done, that is enough. And that is all we need to trust and rely in. That one Jesus, who is more than enough for even our greatest sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us trust more and more in this wonderful good news that Jesus is enough, more than enough for us, and that he is the only way to you. Father, would we take more and more refuge in that, we pray, and would we receive him into our hearts, for it's in his beautiful and abundant name we ask, amen.